proud, self-righteous, and judgmental. Obviously, the proud, the self-righteous, and the judgmental are not the merciful. And so what I would like for us to think about this morning as we go through this lesson is if you have a hard time being merciful toward others, if it's very difficult for you to show mercy to others, and those people that I'm talking about showing mercy to, I'm not talking about those who have asked for your forgiveness, those who have humbled themselves because of something they may have done. I'm not talking about those people who deserve it. If you find a hard time being merciful to those who have not yet asked for forgiveness, who do not deserve forgiveness, if you find it hard to show mercy to them, I would challenge you to consider that the reason is probably because of the pride, the self-righteousness, and the judgmental attitude that is still there. And so as Jesus has went through these first few Beatitudes, it is all about emptying ourselves of these other things so that we can indeed be merciful to others. It's only when you are completely spiritually bankrupt, when you have completely be humbled, been humbled by your sins to the point that it makes you mourn, and that there's this tremendous longing within you for righteousness that only God himself can provide, that you are able to be merciful as the word is used in the scriptures. And this is a very fitting time for Jesus to be talking about being merciful and blessed be the merciful because the Jewish people had been occupied by the Romans for a long period of time. And the Roman people viewed mercy as being the worst of all the qualities that a man could have. It was the lowest of all the qualities. And the reason being is because you weren't a real man. You weren't able to take a life. You weren't able to make hard decisions. You weren't able to exert the, the, um, the, the will of the king upon, or the Caesar upon other nations if you were a merciful type of person. And so their idea and concept of mercy is completely different from any of the ideas and concepts of mercy that we have in our day and time today. So unmerciful were the Roman people that many historians believe that the, the man, the, the husband, the father of the family had the power of life or death over both his wife, his servant, and his children. And that he could have his wife's life taken from her because of certain things that she might do. That the servants were some, some historians have written that the Romans believed that by taking one of your slaves, one of your servants, and casting them into the sea, that they may die so that the fish may eat upon their bodies, those fish would now taste sweeter as a result. They also had the power of life or death when it came to a child being born. If that child was something they did not want or was undesirous in some kind of way that they could end the life of that newborn child. And that's something that causes us to be alarmed. But in our society, women have that right. So let's, let us not think that we are too far removed from the unmerciful nature that they had even in that day and time. How many things in our own life do we think will become better, will become sweeter, will be given more opportunities, more power, more whatever it may be, but the way of obtaining it is by being less merciful? or even unmerciful to others. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful. He doesn't say, blessed are the proud. Blessed are the self-righteous. Blessed are, are the judgmental. So what is meant by this term, mercy? There's a couple different words that are used in the Old Testament primarily, and are sometimes translated, often translated, mercy. One is from chesed, which means kindness or loving kindness. What's interesting about this particular term is that this one in particular is about the mercy that God shows especially upon his own. Vine says that this word is not one that is used about the, um, the, the, the way in which God takes care of all of his creation. It is not about him providing and his providence for all of creation. But this word is primarily used in relationship to the idea of covenant. This word is very close to the word covenant and has a very strong relationship with the idea of covenant. And whenever you see about God keeping his promises and showing favor toward his children in the Old Testament, this is usually the word that is, is uh, used there. But one example of that is in Psalm 103, if you turn there with me, to the 103rd Psalm. And we're going to start reading from verse 8. Psalm 103 and start at verse 8. Psalm 103 and starting at verse 8. It says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, 
and abounding in mercy. Notice how personal it now becomes. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. Verse 10 again. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are higher than the, above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities, notice the relationship again. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. This is talking about that covenant relationship that God has. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass, as flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone. And its place, and its place remembers it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. And his righteousness to his children's children, to such as keep his, co his covenant, and to those who remember his commandment to do them. Again, this word is used to talk about the way in which God is specially for us. And so, yes, God is a merciful God, as we're going to see in just a moment. But God is especially merciful to you as his children to you as those who fear him, to you as those who are considered to be the children of God and are passing this lineage on to others as well. Another word that is used in the Hebrew is rasham, which means the inner part of man. And sometimes when you read something about bowels of mercy or being deeply moved or deeply grieved about something, this is the word that's being used. And so this word, though the first one contains emotion, this one especially so. This is talking about the gut feeling that you have toward those who are in need. That when you see someone who has a, a lacking of something, that you recognize that you are in a position to help that individual, to render aid to that person, and it moves you emotionally to help them in that situation. That's the word that's used here. Notice that in Exodus 34, that we learn not just about who God is, but also about his mercy, considering things such as this, being deeply moved. Exodus 34, verses 5 through 7. Now the Lord descended in a cloud. This is when Moses is making the, the tablets. Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious. Notice the, the emotional impact of what's being talked about long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And so when it's talking about here, it is using a word that we may not recognize as being filled with emotion. But when God is saying this to Moses, he is not having a stern stance where he says, look, I'm going to show mercy, but I am going to punish the offender. He says both of those things. But in the midst of this, he talks about the way in which God himself is being long-suffering toward his creation. That God is not wanting to punish any, but that God is long-suffering and wanting to extend his mercy and his grace and his forgiveness to all of mankind. God is not desirous, nor has he ever been desirous, to destroy mankind because of their sins. It has always been to the very detriment of God's emotional status for him to destroy man. It has always brought him to the idea that we would have of tears because of that. It is the very pain of God's heart to have to destroy because he is a merciful God, even upon those who are his enemies, even upon those who rebel, even upon those who are undeserving of it because we're all deserving of punishment. That is what mercy meant by these two terms. In the New Testament, it comes from a, a Greek word, elios, which means the outward manifestation of pity. It assumes need on the part of him who receives it and resources adequate to meet the need on the part of him who shows it. And so as we go through the lesson, we're going to be looking at not just the, the first two ideas that's there, but as this Greek word sort of encapsulates both of those things. As you know, the uh, contribution that we're giving to, today Anything that's over and above the, uh, the, the regular, the average amount is going to be given to some brethren that are in some needy places. The reason being is because we have pity upon those. We see the need that exists. It causes a visceral reaction within us, an emotional attachment that's there. We recognize that we have the ability to do something about that. 
And because of that, moved by that emotion and moved by the understanding of the amount of opportunity and power really that we have to alleviate some of that, we're supposed to respond. And so mercy is that idea of seeing that need, knowing that we have the ability to meet that need, at least in some measure. And because of that mercifulness that we feel, we extend ourselves in grace and in generosity and in the outpouring of love and in devotion. Blessed are the merciful because it's not just about the spiritual applications, but it's about in every different aspect of a person's life. That's what mercy is all about. And so when we're talking about the word mercy, again, it is about understanding the ability that we had. It's the idea that when you think about Joseph, that Joseph has become second only to Pharaoh. And because of the wisdom that God had given him, he laid up provisions for many years so that Egypt would be taken care of. Joseph sees his brothers that have sold him into slavery. And they are undeserving of any mercy or grace that Joseph or Egypt would show. And yet because of the mercifulness, the compassion, the gentleness, the love and devotion that Joseph felt, and then seeing that he had the ability to provide for that need, he shows mercy to his family. And he doesn't just forgive, but he provides for the things that they need. It's the same idea that you see when Moses, when Aaron and Miriam, as we studied a few months back, when they rose up in rebellion against Moses and God himself had to rebuke them and God even struck Miriam with leprosy because of what had happened, Moses was merciful. He saw himself as being someone who pitied Miriam, who had compassion upon what had happened to her. He was in a position to speak to God and ask God to forgive her and to heal her from this thing. And that's the very thing that he did. That is what mercy is all about. And so there is no source that is any better to learn from than from God himself about what mercy really looks like. And so instead of seeing ourselves as we study through this particular section as the one who is about showing mercy to others, think about the mercy that God has shown to you. The mercy that God has shown to all of us. The mercy that God has shown even to the rebellious and the wayward and the ones that will not profess his name and the mercy that God extends to all. God is indeed a merciful God and we thank him for that because God is the one who seeks to rescue us from all of our distress because that is what mercy is about. Mercy is about recognizing, seeing someone in distress, whatever that distress may be. It's real easy for us to be generous. But generosity is, is about giving to someone who may not be in need. And it's about giving to someone that we already feel is deserving of it. Or we just want to show that generosity to them. Mercy is a lot different. Because mercy recognizes that there is a distressful situation at hand. Micah talks about this in Micah chapter 7 verses 18 and 19. Micah 7 verses 18 and 19. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. In verses 18 and 19, God is exalted to this high position. Because he is one who does not need, there is no necessity for God to justify the destruction of his enemies. He doesn't have to do that. There is not a single person on the face of the earth that God has to justify why he would not destroy them. But he doesn't do it. And he doesn't want to do it. And he doesn't just pardon iniquity, but he separates us from it as far as the east is from the west. Because he sees not just the need for the forgiveness of our sins, but, for the, but also from the removal from those sins. When we look at grace in just a moment, grace is about getting rid of the guilt of the sin. But it's not about the consequences. Mercy is about the consequences. I can forgive you, but it does not necessarily mean that I've been forgiven or that, I, that you have been shown mercy. 
I can forgive you your sins, but it does not necessarily mean I've been merciful to you. Mercy means not only do I forgive you of your sins, but I help you to remain separated from it. If there is something that you have done that's damaged the relationship between you and I, I can forgive you of those sins. I can forgive you of what you've done, but it does not mean necessarily that I've been merciful. Merciful means that I seek to restore, that I seek to reconcile, that I seek to help you to where you do not do that to others or to me again either because this is something that damages you and it causes a separation that you are hurting from. That's what mercy is about because that recognizes the distress that is there. So in 1 Peter 5 and verse 7, Peter reminds the brethren there that we are to cast all our care upon the Lord. And notice that it says this, cast all your care upon him because he cares for you. And all your anxieties, all your fears, all the things that are bothering and troubling you, cast all of those anxieties upon the Lord because he does care for you. What is inherent in that is that God does see it. And God is, effect, is affected by that. He cares when he sees you crying. He cares when he sees you oppressed. He cares when he sees injustices cast upon you. He cares when he sees that you've been sinned against. He cares when he sees that you have sinned. He cares because of the, the turmoil and the consequences you're going through as a result of that. He cares about that, which by necessity means because God is in a position, not only does he see it, but that God, because of him being merciful, responds to it. And so what is needed for you? What is going to help you in that situation? What is the thing that's going to bring about restoration in that? Because God is not just a loving God, but he is a merciful God. He can love you just like many people love you, but they're not merciful towards you because there's no distress, there's no need. Mercy is extended because they love you and they recognize the need and they respond to it. That's what mercy is. And that's why we serve such a wonderful God because he responds in such a fashion. And it is something that, that flows out of the love and the affection that he has for all of mankind. In Ephesians chapter 2, a chapter that's unfortunately been hijacked by those who would teach false doctrines about faith only. And because of that, we often miss just how beautiful a, a section of scripture it really is. In Ephesians chapter 2, as Paul in his letter talks about the way in which we were in need, because in verse 1, we were dead in our trespasses and sins, that we were walking according to the wrong frame of mind, according to the course of this world, that we had been taken captive and under the influence of the power of the, of the air, and this spirit was now working in those who were disobedient. We were following after the, the lust of our own flesh, but God responded to that. The wrath that was due to us, God responded to that. The distress that was in their lives, in our lives as well, God responded to that. And with that beautiful turning of the phrase and the turning of mankind itself, but God. This is all the things we have chosen, all the things that we have pursued, all the things that we have done, but God responded to it. And notice that Paul says why he did it. Because he is rich in mercy. Why is he rich in mercy? Because of his great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in trespasses. Made us alive together with Christ. And it's in that context that Paul exalts with this parenthetical phrase. Thanks be to God for his grace. His immeasurable, wonderful, awesome, undeserved, unearned grace. Thanks be to God for his grace. That's how much mercy God shows because of how much love that he has. Again, love is an unconditional thing. Love is something that is unearned, unearned it is undeserved, and it's, it's without bounds. Love is just something that is always and everlasting. You love, but mercy... It's something that God extends that you have to accept. Because God is one that when he shows his mercy to you, what are you going to do with that? It's just like with the contribution that we're going to make and, and send to others. That is an act of mercy and an act of grace and an act of love. 
But those brethren can say, we don't want it. We don't need it. They can, tr they can refuse it. But it doesn't mean that we have not extended it and shown it. And that's what Paul is talking about in this chapter. He has shown it to all of mankind. And what are we going to do from it? It flows from his love. And because of the mercy that he has, his grace then shows forth from that mercy. Mercy is responding to the need. Mercy is about feeling the need first and foremost and responding to it. The response that you show to mercy is what grace is about. Because mercy is shown to those who do not earn it and do not deserve it, just like grace. Mercy is about not receiving the things that you deserve. We use that definition a lot. Grace is about receiving the things you do not deserve. But they work hand in hand. Instead of looking at people and saying, well, you put yourself in this position yourself, so you're going to have to deal with it. Whether that be in the physical realm or the spiritual realm. You brought this upon yourself, a man reaps whatever it is that he sows. And just like it was when Jesus was saying this in the Beatitudes, people would use the law itself to justify not doing the right thing. To be able to say to someone else, no, I'm not going to give you that, or I am going to punish you to the fullest extent of the law because an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And Jesus said that was never the intent of any of the things that God had said. But instead, we're supposed to be like our God and be merciful. And when we're like our God and we're merciful, we show grace. So in other words, we don't give what it is that you deserve. And we will give you what you don't deserve. That is what mercy and grace are supposed to do and how they work hand in hand. Now you think about how it is that God has shown these types of things toward us. Every one of us were deserving of death. But God saw us as being his own creation and created in his own image. And God loved us so much that not only did he give us free will, but that when he knew that that free will would cause us to choose to not be with him, God still sent his son to die for all of our sins. And so God did not visit man with what he was deserving of, eternal destruction. He visited man with he himself in the flesh, in the form of Christ. He showed his mercy to all of mankind by taking upon himself the death on the cross and the way in which mankind treated him by spitting upon him and driving nails into his flesh, a crown of thorns upon his head and blood dripping from his sides, by putting him in the ground saying, finally he's out of our sight. That's how man responded. And God was merciful in allowing those things to happen. And through his mercy... God is able to show to each and every one of us and give to each and every one of us what it is that we don't deserve. Grace. Because there has to be punishment for sin for God both to be merciful and to be gracious. And so that is how it works in all of our lives. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 20, or Titus first, Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. Titus 3 and verse 5. It is not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Spirit. Also in Hebrews, if you turn over just a few pages to Hebrews chapter 10 and starting at verse 26, it says that if we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. But a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. It says that anyone who rejected Moses' law dies without mercy. Notice that word in verse 28, dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he has been sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace then in both of those verses, mercy and grace are, are spoken of. And it's used in relationship to the way in which someone in the Old Testament, that if they died by the testimony of two or three witnesses, they died without mercy. The place in which the Israelite found mercy was a place called the mercy seat. He would go and take his sin offering and he would sacrifice it upon that golden lid, upon that mercy seat. 
And that's the place where God would meet man to show his mercy and his grace. And so with Jesus Christ, it's that same thing. Jesus was the one who was sacrificed. His blood was spilt. And if we refuse that mercy, God cannot show us grace. If we insult that spirit of grace, that spirit that showed mercy, that gave man the opportunity for mercy because of the sacrifice that was made by Jesus Christ, if we, if we refuse that, if we trample it underfoot, of how much more punishment do you think you will be thought worthy? God can't show you any grace because you've rejected even his mercy in those situations. And so we have to be held accountable. And as it says in Ephesians chapter 1, the flip side of that very idea is this. In Philippians, or Ephesians rather, chapter 1 and verse 7. In Christ, in Him, we have redemption through His blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace, which He made to abound toward us all in wisdom and prudence. That is in Christ Jesus we find these things. This is how God showed His mercy and His grace because he loved us that much, because he abounds in mercy and desires to show it to all of mankind. And so God is both merciful and he is just. And so this is what we have to see. What was the price that God paid? Because this is the point of mercy. Mercy does not overlook sin. Mercy does not overlook transgression. Mercy does not overlook need. When we see sin and transgression as being a need, that needs to be met instead of an offense that needs to be confronted. We know there's verses that talk about that, but when we're talking about mercy, mercy is not about confronting sin that we might just condemn it. Mercy is about confronting sin as it exists as a need that has to be met in that person's life. And so that is the price that had to be paid by God because this is the point of it. Anytime there's forgiveness, Anytime there, is, anytime there is mercy given, a price has to be paid. A price has to be paid by someone. But the one who is being shown mercy is not the one who, who pays that price. The one who is showing the mercy is the one who pays that price. That's why mercy is so hard. That's why mercy is so difficult. And that's why mercy can only be in the life of a Christian when he has emptied himself, when he is poor in spirit, when he mourns, when he is meek, and when he hungers and thirsts after righteousness. Blessed are those who are merciful. They will be shown mercy because they have been willing to pay the price of others. In Luke chapter 10... You have the story of the Good Samaritan, that you have these, these other two that are, that are high. You have the, the Levite, and they come and they, and they see the man who's on the side of the road, who's been beaten and robbed. And it may be that they looked and said, you know what, the law says that you can't touch a dead body. And so maybe they thought he was dead, and for that reason they didn't come and do anything about it. Because the law said you're not supposed to touch a dead body. But the Samaritan, when he came upon the scene, he went over and responded to the need that he saw. And he takes the man. He lays him upon his own animal. He takes him, and he takes him to the inn and tells the innkeeper, I will pay the price of whatever is needed to meet the need of this person who is there. That is no different than when we come up to Hebrews 2 and verse 17, that God sees every one of us as being dead in our trespasses and our sins. And instead of saying that that's a dead body, that's someone who is useless, that's someone who is worthless, that's someone who has brought themselves to that own situation, Jesus was a faithful and just high priest and became the propitiation for the sins of all of mankind. Jesus paid the price because that's what mercy is about. And that's how mercy and merciful people respond. And so that is why Jesus says, blessed are those who are merciful. Blessed are the merciful. Jesus did not say, blessed are those who help others because it soothes their conscience. Jesus didn't say that you say to someone who asks your forgiveness, well, I forgive you because I know that's what I have to do. I have to forgive you. I, I begrudgingly, I hesitantly, I with reservation forgive. That's not mercy. That's only to soothe my conscience. 
That's why when you hear people talk about forgiveness, especially in this aspect, that forgiveness is more about you than it is the person who did the offense. Because God's the one who has to forgive them of that sin. But you have to forgive, and really it's more about you forgiving than it is about them being forgiven. Because Jesus here, in this context, blessed are the merciful. Can I forgive that way? Can I forgive others the way that God forgave me? Can I do that? He also doesn't say, you know, blessed are those who are merciful or, or do these things because it exalts them or shows them to be better or greater than other people. These are the kinds of people who will hold it over your head and keep bringing it up. Well, you know, I forgave you when you did that. Well, did you? Or was it so that you might gain status? That you might gain some more power as a result of it? See, mercy is about paying the cost. You paying the cost. That's what mercy is. Who's paying the price in that? Again, in the book of Micah, Micah 6 and verse 8 and this is in the discourse, is, is God wanting all these different sacrifices? Instead, in verse 8, He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? Notice how some of those things that are in that verse are things that we talked about even in the Beatitudes. And that is indeed the challenge because mercy is just like grace. It's, it's no longer mercy if the person deserves it or has to earn it. It's not mercy then. It may be generosity, but it's not mercy. It may be having a, a generous spirit, but it's not mercy. There's a difference. Mercy makes you vulnerable because the person on the other end that you're extending mercy to is someone that they may not have even asked for it, just as God did with all of us. And whether they accept that mercy or not is it, their decision to make. But we are to be merciful in, in granting that to others. That's why Jesus could on the cross say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing because Jesus was merciful. Whether they accepted it or not was, was for them to decide. But Jesus was merciful. Father, forgive them. Who is my enemy? Who is the one that I do not want to forgive? Who is the one who has offended me and done horrible things to me that the very sight of them or the sound of their voice causes my, my blood to boil? That's the one that I need to be praying for. That's the one that I need to be merciful toward. Because Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And that is the point of all of it. In the physical realm, we know it. Matthew 25, Jesus says that when you see those who are without the basic necessities of life, the hungry, the thirsty, those without clothing, those who are sick, those who are in prison, and you visit them, you pay the price. Jesus says, you've done it to me. Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 36, Jesus talks about all these different people. They come to you and they, and they take one article of clothing and they don't stop at that. They go even further to take something else. Jesus says, give it to them. They come to you, they compel you to go with, with, with them one mile. Jesus says, go with them too. You be merciful and you will be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect because he shows his mercy to all of mankind. The sun came up this morning. We have food, water, and clothing. And that's not limited only to us, but everyone has that very thing. Blessed are the merciful, spiritually speaking. James 2 and verse 13, judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Matthew 18, how many times should I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Be merciful. Judgment is going to be without mercy to those who have not shown mercy. We will not be forgiven if we do not forgive others. In our attitudes toward other people, Colossians chapter 3, let's look at this together. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Colossians 3, starting at verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, notice the attitudes we're supposed to have. Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do. But above all these things, he says in verse 14, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. 
even in the attitudes that we have that Jesus himself showed. So blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Brethren, if we want to find God's mercy, and that's the question I'm going to leave you this morning, is if you would find God's mercy, it has to be because you are willing to show mercy to others. That's the high cost of becoming a Christian. And when you look at this one here, on the heels of what Jesus has already talked about in the Beatitudes, brethren, that is a challenge. And Jesus says, blessed, happy, so very happy are those who can show mercy to others. What a release it would be of grudges, of animosity, of fear, of anger, of frustration to be able to let go. Brethren, that is a challenge for me. I know those who I do not wish to, in the deepest parts of me, want to have to show mercy to. That is why I went through the Beatitudes. Be merciful. Because God was merciful to you. God was merciful to me. And if you want me to show you mercy in the end, you show mercy now. That's what it's about. If that's been a challenge for you and you need some help in that, if you need to obey the gospel so that you can be forgiven of your sins, God is a merciful God. And he wants to forgive and he wants to show you grace. If that's where you're at this morning and we can help in any way, please let us know as together we stand and sing this song.